In 2020, while many countries were in a COVID-19 lockdown, global emissions of climate heating gases dropped. But now as the world slowly reopens, they've shot back up. It's been just three years since the wake-up call from the UN's Climate Science Panel, urging the world to halve emissions by 2030 and reach net zero emissions by 2050, if we are to avoid catastrophic climate change. We know something needs to be done, and quickly. So what if part of solving the puzzle was something that's all around us? The universe's most common element. But first, let's take a quick look at the problem. Greenhouse gases are emitted into the atmosphere from different sources, including transport, power production, heavy industry and agriculture. To curb accelerating climate change, governments and companies are announcing commitments to decarbonize and cut their emissions to net zero because doing nothing is no longer an option. There are no exceptions to this, so we're now in a, in a race to make sure we, we have a low carbon equivalent for all of the things we need for our economy and our civilization. This means huge change is needed, not only from the countries with the highest emissions output, but also from the companies that contribute most to planet harming emissions. These are some of the areas which are huge challenges and that's what we really need to sink our teeth into. That's where green hydrogen could come in. It's been heralded as a solution that could contribute to environmentally friendly change across everything from home heating to transport, as well as difficult to decarbonize heavy industry sectors like steel, cement and fertilizer production. And over the next three decades, its use is forecast to grow from 150 million tonnes to 500 to 800 million tonnes every year. So how does it work? Hydrogen is everywhere. You won't find it on its own. Instead, it links up with other elements, like here in H2O. To use hydrogen for energy, it needs to be split from other elements through a process called electrolysis, which uses a lot of electricity. Hydrogen that's been produced like this, exclusively using renewable energy power like wind, water and solar, is known as green hydrogen. But at the moment, other more common types of hydrogen production aren't green and have a big environmental impact. About 6% of the world's natural gas supplies and 2% of coal are used to create hydrogen. In fact, fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas account for almost 99% of current hydrogen production. And for that reason, hydrogen accounts for a surprisingly large share of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Brown hydrogen, the oldest type, is made by transforming coal into gas and separating out the hydrogen. Then there's grey hydrogen, made through a process called steam reforming, which brings together natural gas and heated water in the form of steam. Blue hydrogen, on the other hand, is when the carbon dioxide emitted from the production of hydrogen, mainly from gas, is captured and stored by injecting it into rock formations deep underground. First, let's focus on green hydrogen, which has the most promising potential for fighting climate change. There is one particular carbon intensive sector that could be transformed by green hydrogen, transport. Fuel cells power an electric motor using hydrogen, which is a clean burning, zero emissions fuel. It's only byproduct, water vapor. If you've got a really heavy vehicle that's got really high utilization and wants to go really long distances, then hydrogen is the obvious choice. This is partly down to hydrogen's density. Small volumes of hydrogen can hold a lot of energy, with fuel cells also taking up a smaller amount of space than the lithium batteries powering electric vehicles, meaning you can travel further with less weight using less fuel. Some of the biggest benefits could be seen in hard to electrify areas like shipping, long haul trucking and transcontinental flights. For these, electric transport is often seen as inefficient or difficult to achieve. If a boat's going around the world, having a battery that could power that voyage would be enormous and very costly and take up a good size of the boat. But while there are positives, there are some downsides too. A major one is lack of infrastructure. There are currently only about 400 hydrogen refueling stations around the world. In January 2020, China had 61 hydrogen refueling stations compared with 81 in Germany and 116 in Japan. The UK, just 20. And then there's the cost. Hydrogen-powered commercial vehicles are still very expensive compared to their electric counterparts. If you have a bit of a chicken and egg problem, I have to have the filling stations before I can have the vehicles, and I have to have the vehicles to justify having the filling stations. The real challenge is how to build a market for it. 
So where are we already seeing green hydrogen being used? We've now seen globally over 220 projects being announced. That represents over $300 billion worth of investment um, to come forward by 2030. Europe represents about 45% of that, followed by Asia. 50% um, of the investment in Asia comes from China. There's a reasonable split between green and blue projects. These and other strategies mean hydrogen could meet 18% of the world's final energy demand by 2050 and provide roughly 20% of the CO2 reduction required to limit global warming, according to the Hydrogen Council. But it's not that straightforward. Not only will it need huge changes to energy infrastructure, but also a worldwide investment of $15 trillion, according to the Energy Transitions Commission. One infrastructure solution could be using existing gas grids for hydrogen distribution, creating a blended network of natural gas and hydrogen. But there are pitfalls here too. The climate credentials aren't very good, so blending only makes a, a small contribution to lowering emissions. Supporters say this blended fuel could potentially help the transition away from gas boilers for home heating to a hydrogen-based system, which could help decarbonize the fifth of global energy demand that comes from heating for buildings. But some environmentalists say electric heat pumps are a greener and already viable option. However, a hydrogen supply network could also provide capacity to store surplus energy produced from renewables and balance out energy fluctuations as well as strain on the electricity grid. But what do you do in the winter when you have only a few hours of solar power? If you can convert that solar energy to hydrogen, then you can use the hydrogen um, to power, you know, electricity in your home and to power electricity into the grid. There are some other problems too. The world might struggle to produce enough renewable power to meet the energy demand needed for green hydrogen production. So what's next for green hydrogen? The good news is that the cost of energy from renewable resources is lower than it has ever been. And the same is expected of electrolyzers over the next few years. This means that green hydrogen is predicted to become cheaper than other types of hydrogen production by 2030. In the meantime, some say other types of hydrogen, like blue hydrogen, could be used as a bridging solution until green hydrogen becomes cheaper to produce and more widely available. But not everyone agrees. Multiple studies have shown that green hydrogen is likely to be more economically viable than blue hydrogen by as soon as 2030. Blue hydrogen infrastructure that is built up over the next few years would have very few years in operation before it is undercut by green. This all means a hydrogen revolution could be less green than many think. And some green groups have warned there is a risk government money earmarked to fight climate change and air pollution could be diverted from renewables and end up as a new form of dirty subsidy. We shouldn't enter into subsidising industries lightly uh, and we must make sure that where we are providing subsidies, that the negative and unintended consequences of those subsidies is recognised, measured and evaluated to ensure that the benefits don't outweigh the cost. In practice, however, carbon capture and storage technology is not proven at scale and is expected to reach at best 85 to 95 percent efficiency. Which means that 5 to 15 percent of all CO2 emissions from hydrogen production could escape into the atmosphere. In addition, natural gas extraction and transportation leaks methane, which has a much higher short-term warming effect than CO2. The average emissions of blue hydrogen therefore still aren't considered as climate neutral by many. Then there's the consumer. During what's going to be a big change in energy systems, will we be able to afford it? It'll be really important that as we go through our energy system, we don't push more people into fuel poverty. And we don't end up with a situation where it is only those who have higher incomes that can afford to go on the decarbonisation journey. 